I have a brand new Chris $20 bill for anybody who can tell me who was the first person who said content is king, except for my team because that would be cheating. Any, any takers? Wow, very good, very good. That's seriously, there you go. No, seriously, seriously. That's, that's the first person who's actually gotten that in like three or four presentations, so very well done. A lot of people's immediate response is this gentleman, right, Mr. Joe Polizzi uh, from the Content Marketing Institute. If you have not had a chance to see, see Joe speak or go to Content Marketing World, it is a wonderful conference. Uh, Content Marketing Institute actually just sold for, I believe it was $10 million or $11 million. Uh, and what's interesting about that is this book right here, Content Inc., I encourage all of you guys to pick this up. Uh, this is the book on the content business model. So in this book, you will find six tenets of how to build a content ink business model. And I think Joe just absolutely legitimized the model in this book because he just sold his company that was completely developed on the model in the book. So go check that out. That's who most people guess. But the truth of the matter is that the person who did originate Content is King was Mr. William Gates. And that was way back in 1996 in an article on the Microsoft blog. And yes, there were blogs back in 1996. We still called them journaling back then. Um, but it was Mr. Gates. And so I want to go to this article, and I go to Bing, which is obviously Microsoft search engine, and I search, you know, just simple Boolean search, Bill Gates, capital A-N-D, and content is king. And if you notice, I don't pull up any of the the actual article. It's just nowhere to be found. So that should be a, a telltale as to what search engine you choose to use. Um, hopefully there's no Microsoft employees in the room. But if you go to a neat little tool called the Wayback Machine, how many people are familiar with the Wayback Machine? I'm not actually sure if it's still around, but let it be known that anything that you put on the internet will be there for eternity, and you can use tools like the Wayback Machine to scour the archives of the internet and pull up any site that's ever been developed. And if you look at the original article, I think the way that Bill opens the article is very interesting. A little bit small to see, so I'll read it. Content is where I expect much of the real money will be made on the internet, just as it was in broadcasting. Think about that for a minute. At the time, in 1996, everybody looked at the internet and it was nothing but bits and bytes and information, right? How many people remember the information superhighway, right? Yeah, that's, that's a fun term. Um, Bill is actually looking at the internet and said, wait a minute, this is more than just bits and data. This is a network, right? This is very similar to other networks that we saw of the day. The television revolution that began a half century ago spawned a number of industries, including the manufacturing of TV sets. But the long-term winners were those who used the medium to deliver information and entertainment. So think about that for a minute. We've heard that from every single speaker that has been up today. Edutainment, information, entertainment. That's essentially what content is, isn't it? It's information and entertainment. But let's think back to 1996 when Bill was referencing television networks, right, and the television industry. And if you think about the television industry, there's not a lot of us, with the exception of maybe the Super Bowl, that watch television for the commercials. Even marketers don't necessarily watch television for the commercials. We watch for the programming. We watch for the content that creates regular habits, regular viewing habits among us. That is what gives the value to the network so that advertisers can promote their brands. And that's really how TV became popular, was by the content that allows us to advertise in the same space, right? So something funny is happening. Television viewing has been on the decline for some time. Okay, uh, and we've seen this trend, and there's a lot of different reasons, but since about 2008, television viewing overall is on the decline. Now, are less people watching television? Probably not, right? There's just so many more options out there for that video experience. Furthermore, over the past five years, household with, with households with cable subscriptions have actually also declined, right? So how many people, just by a show of hands, still have a subscription to cable in their house. Okay, so maybe about half, half the room, which is really interesting. What's even more interesting is I saw the millennials raise their hand, which is crazy to me. My family hasn't had television for about four or five years, but we do have active subscriptions on Netflix. We used to subscribe to Hulu until they stopped putting interesting programming on. Uh, we have Amazon Prime, and we, we, we don't even buy DVDs anymore. We have all of our videos on Amazon Prime because that streams directly through the, the TV set in my living room. 
right? So cable subscriptions are going away. Television viewing is on the decline. So how do the advertisers respond? Well, hey, let's just increase our ad inventory, right? Let's just advertise more because if there's less people watching, then we really need to hit them. We really need to drill down and hit them with more ads, right? The problem is, is that that didn't necessarily work either. So Viacom, which increased ad load by about 7%, and these come from uh, Bernstein, an analytics company that measures television analytics. Viacom increases its ad load by 7%. A&E goes up 5%, and they were two of the worst offenders in terms of actually losing audience share. So by turning up the juice on just advertising and promoting and saying, here's our stuff, here's our stuff, here's our stuff, they started to turn people away. All right? Now, there's definitely a gentleman who doesn't turn people away. He actually brings people to him. And the reason why I bring this up, one of our clients is a Catholic book publisher in Cincinnati. And so we've done a lot of work with Franciscan Media. And one of the big events that we helped them this year was when the Pope came to America for the first visit to the Americas since Pope Francis was in power. But I think outside of Pope Francis being kind of the first Pope to ever take a selfie, uh, there's an interesting lesson here. So... For any Catholics in the room, you may recognize this photo. This is an Associated Press photo of St. Peter's Basilica in 2005. Who can take a guess what happened in 2005? Anybody? This was the, f the funeral of Pope John Paul II, correct? So if you look at this photo, everybody's lined up in St. Peter's Basilica, and right next to this lady who's photobombing the picture, uh, there is a very, very progressive technology person who has a flip phone and is taking a picture, probably in one megapixel, of this monumental event. Now, let's go ahead and fast forward to 2013, when Pope Francis was kind of inaugurated. I don't know if you say it's inaugurated or sworn in, but this is the same location, St. Peter's Basilica, in 2013. Obviously, there's a huge difference there. We all now have the ability to not only consume media, consume video, consume audio, but also produce audio video right in the pockets, right, right in our pants today. So as of July of 2015, and these stats are almost a year old now, the report should be coming out pretty soon, 77.1% of America who had mobile phones has a smart mobile device. What that means is that Flip phones, like we saw in that photo, aren't even being produced anymore. And this adoption, this adoption of smart mobile devices that are internet ready, app enabled, it's not going to stop. This is a freight train that's constantly moving. We also know that globally, and this was reported by Cisco, uh, part of their visual marketing index, uh, globally, IP video is going to represent, or it's projected to represent 80% of all internet traffic. Not just searches, not anything. 80% of all internet traffic is estimated by 2019. So that's a pretty, pretty uh, huge increase. And they do this study regularly on an annual basis. On top of that, we're seeing Netflix subscribers go up. We're seeing Amazon and Hulu and all these online options for video consumption just start to increase, just start to spike drastically. This is indicating what is a seismic shift in the way that we consume video, okay? Simple show of hands, how many people in the room have watched a video on their phone or tablet within the last 24 hours? Pretty much all the hands grow up. Notice that when I ask the cable subscription question, half the hands go up. When I ask about video on the phone, almost every hand in the room goes up. So my question to you is, what are you doing as a business about this? Because there's probably a large majority of businesses in this room that can never or will never be able to afford to advertise on television, even at the local level. It's very, very expensive. But you all in your pockets today have the ability to produce video, to produce your own advertisements, to produce your own video content and really hook the audience in on what you have to say. One of the things that Netflix does very, very well is they are the first video streaming service to really move into the area of producing original content and or sourcing content that they can run on their network. Uh, if anybody watches Orange and the New Black, that season actually, I believe, just released last week. Uh, I know my wife has already blocked out time for the proverbial binge watching. But that is one of the things that Netflix has also done because instead of having to watch one episode per week, that's littered with advertisements every 10 to 5 to 10 minutes, 
now we can sit down on a Saturday and complete a season, right? We can completely binge watch any programming that we want. And all the marketers and advertisers in the room started to shake and shiver and freak out because suddenly the entire industry has been disrupted, right? The way that we have done things in the past simply does not work anymore because consumers have told us differently. We have told the marketers and advertisers differently. So this is what Bill leaves us with. The long-term winners are those who use the medium to deliver information and entertainment. And that is really the key to success in terms of video marketing for the next five to 10 years is delivering information and entertainment. Call it anything you want, edutainment, whatever the term is. But it's the combination of those two things, informing and making it interesting and entertaining for somebody that is what's going to keep them coming back. So the presentation today is going to give you five simple steps in terms of things that you can go and you can do right away. You could leave and you could get started on this tomorrow and have things in place by next week because it's that easy. It's that easy to produce video that there's no longer any excuses for any business not to be producing their own video content. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So number one, build a permanent office studio. How many people in the, in the room in their business have video equipment? That, that is available in the office. A few hands go up. An interesting thing has happened in the video equipment or the video production market is that with the advent of things like iPhone video, HD video on our mobile devices, DSLR cameras, Canon uh, 5Ds, 60Ds, video equipment has become commoditized. There's a tiny little company in Columbus called Mills James Productions. Mills James has been around for years and years and years. And at one point, they held all the cards to all the production business in and around the area. A large part of that was because they had the money and made the investment in the studios and in very, very expensive, hard to maintain equipment that took specialists to be able to operate. Those days are completely gone. A lot of you in your pocket right now, if you have an iPhone, have the same production capability. You can shoot video in the same definition as some of the major production houses, okay? And with very simple add-ons and tools like microphones, you can get capture great audio. You can do a lot of this, whereas before you had to buy your way in and then train your way in to be able to do this. It's much easier now. One of the ways that you increase your frequency and your spontaneity of producing video is by making a permanent place in your office, maybe it's an old conference room, a spare office, a broom closet, where you can keep this equipment set up. You can go and you can buy a simple lighting uh, kit for between $150 and $500 on, on Amazon, have it shipped right to your door with soft boxes. LEDs are incredibly cheap and incredibly efficient in terms of energy, and you can just keep those permanently set up. I know at my desk uh, in, in my own office, I actually have two LED lights that sit on top of my desk because we do a lot of webcasts, and we do a lot of video interviews using uh, Zoom video conferencing. And so I never have to worry about resetting up the lights. I can just flick them on now, and it's ready to go in two seconds. And because of that, if I have an opportunity where I'm talking with somebody on a video conference and they start to talk about something interesting, I can say, hold on, would you mind if I ask you a quick questions and just record this real quick and flip on the lights and I'm ready to go? And even if I don't know what I'm going to do with that content, I still have it, right? It's better to capture it and have it and figure out what you're going to do with it later than to not capture it at all. So this is also uh, just a real quick snapshot of the office studio that we set up. This is just a spare conference room. It's actually Cody's office. If you look there, we've got a, a, a very cheap mixing board, a USB mixing board that we got off of Amazon. I think it was a few hundred dollars hooked up to a simple iMac. We invested in uh, some studio mics. They were about $50 a piece. The quality is amazing. You can get all this stuff on Amazon, or you can go to you know, any other uh, B&H photo. Photo is another one where you can get a lot of this equipment. Uh, a few simple tripods. That's actually a tablecloth hanging off the back wall as a black backdrop because tablecloths are incredibly cheap. If you don't want to use a tablecloth, you can invest a few hundred dollars to get uh, kind of a backdrop and a scrim, just like that. Very easy to set up and tear down. Or if you want to get really tricky with it, you can go to any of your local photography shops and you can buy rolls of paper that are colored, that have textured backgrounds. And for less than $10, you can have multiple different color backgrounds for different types of videos. This is very useful for the talking head type videos and uh, recording some customer testimonials, uh, some of the how-to type videos, other simple interviews that are just interesting content. But the point of all this too, 
too, is if you leave it set up and you dedicate a little bit of your budget to buying some of this very affordable equipment, suddenly you will be able to have a production studio and increase the spontaneity and increase your opportunities to capture the video content. Remember that if you don't capture it, there's nothing you can do with it later. So if you'd like to learn more about how to actually go into the nuts and bolts of three-point lighting, different types of colored backdrops, how to get focus, and all the tips and tricks that go around with uh, video production, Wistia, how many folks have heard of Wistia in the room? Excellent technology. Uh, they're based out of Boston. They partner with HubSpot. They partner with a lot of different organizations, but they have a learning resource library. We've talked a lot about these resource pages or resource centers. They have a complete learning center that is dedicated to teaching you how to tips and tricks on how to produce your own video. Uh, one of my favorites, you don't actually even need to go buy a full lighting kit off of Amazon. You can go to your local Home Depot or Lowe's and you can get shop lights and wax paper and actually make your own production lights in a three-point lighting kit for less than 50 bucks. If you wanna go ahead and do it that way, make sure you get strong clips so you don't have lights falling on the floor in the middle of a production because that's a fire hazard and I don't wanna be sued. Um, you can go to bit.ly forward slash DIY dash studio. It'll take you to the Wistia Learning Lab or you can scan that QR code because uh, I still think QR codes are cool. I may be the only person, but I still think they're cool. I'm Bill Warner with Pro Spray Automotive Finishes. And in today's video, we're going to be discussing the proper application of clear coats. Application of clear coats are very important. That's the last thing you see in the finish of the paint job. Make sure your base coat has been applied, it's dried properly between coats. Choose a solvent and the hardener for the size of the repair, the area of the repair, and the temperature and the humidity for the day. All good brand paint guns will work properly. These are just tools that, like anything else, a painter will choose based on his own liking. But they'll all give you good results. We're going to put on two coats. The first coat will be a nice medium to wet coat. So this video is a few years old now, and it was shot when Pro Spray Automotive was, was acquired by U.S. Chemical. I think the company has since been sold, but Bill was actually one of their engineers. He actually worked in the spray shop, uh, and they knew that their audience was folks that they called jobbers. So these are typically people working in auto body detail shops. They're blue collar workers. They don't really have a desktop in front of them or they are up and moving around so much that they don't really sit down at a computer a lot. But what they do have is phones and tablets. And so ProSpray decided, you know what, we're going to produce all of this content to teach people how to better use our products, how to properly apply different types of clear coat, uh, how to uh, do things like assemble a spray gun. And if you look, this is just a screenshot of their channel. They have hundreds and hundreds of different videos that are all on this channel. The one that I just showed you was the first minute of, of probably a three minute video. Uh, but the last time I checked, there was about 50,000 viewers on the video for how to assemble a spray gun. And there are three videos in that series. So take a wild guess as to what Pro Spray Automotive does not sell. What do they not sell? They do not sell spray guns. They sell the stuff that goes inside the spray guns. But they're smart enough to know that if you are going to apply their product, you better know how to assemble a spray gun. You better know how to buy the right spray gun. You better know how to clean and disassemble and safely store a spray gun. And if they teach you that, you start to trust them. And you start to bookmark this channel and subscribe and go back video after video. And who knows, maybe this ends up leading to your body shop actually switching vendors over to ProSpray because of all these informational materials that allow you to bring in new associates and train them as you grow. So this is just one way to look at using video as a way to inform and educate your audience. So number two, establish your video channel. One of the things that Polizzi talks about in Content Inc. that I really, really like is this idea of building the base, one of the concepts. And I think we as marketers have gotten very, very guilty of we have all this content or we have some content. Now we have to have content for Facebook and Instagram and our blog and our YouTube channel. And oh, now we want to do Facebook live streaming. And there's all these things that we have to do. And Polizzi says, you know what? That's not the way to go because you can only be with one button one place at one time. So if you spread your eggs out over all these baskets, you're not going to do any of them well. Pick one. If you're going to do a type of content, pick 
of video content with one channel and one theme and do that consistently and frequently over and over because that consistency and that frequency is what's going to build the base. And I'll even argue that going one step further makes all the difference in the world. And that one step is called episodic content. Okay, if you look at the podcasting trends in terms of audio, podcasts are typically released on the same time every week or every day, depending on the nature of the show. It's usually re released very, very consistently, and people start to build that expectation of this is when new content is coming out. And if you think about that, that's very much how television worked. My family loves to watch Modern Family, and we know that historically Modern Family has been on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m., and so we all gather around the TV, and that's one of the shows that we watch together as a family. Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. So that's where I want to challenge you. As you're building your video channel, whether it's on Vimeo or YouTube or Wistia or on your website, wherever that may be, how are you going to produce video consistently and frequently and release new content at the same time on the same channel on the same day of the week over and over and over and over again? If you do that for 90 to 180 days to 12 months, then you're going to really see that audience go because you're going to establish expectations in the mind of the audience to come back. So some of the tools that you can use to do this, and this is just a sample of them, there are tons and tons of video marketing platforms out there. Wistia is what's considered a video marketing platform. So very, very good for embedding video onto your site and getting deep, deep analytics in terms of who's watching the video, when are they falling off, what areas of the video are they clicking on or looking at with heat tracking maps, and it integrates with a lot of different technologies such as HubSpot, such as Oracle, few others. Um, one of the things where Wistia falls down is it is not a network. It is not a social network that is going to allow you to take the content to where the audience is. You will have to bring the audience to your platform, and Wistia is going to give you the ability to convert their attention into things that eventually end up in dollars for your company. An example of this would be uh, what they call turnstile. So in the actual video player box, you can slide out a form that allows you to capture first name, last name, email address, and ideally some type of qualifying question for the persona, but you can capture that information right from the video player. And Vidyard is very, very similar to that. Bright Cove is a little bit different, but also in that same category, whereas YouTube and Vimeo are, they will provide you with the analytics. They are net built-in networks. Vimeo tends to be uh, a lot of movie producers, a lot of freelancers, a lot of video firms use Vimeo, whereas YouTube is pretty much everybody in the world and has a lot of search advantages because they are owned by the number one search engine in the world. Facebook, I think, and I agree with a lot of the presenters, Facebook is the advent of where video is going to go. Uh, a few months ago, actually almost a year ago at this point, I had the chance to go out to the New York office of Facebook. We had a Columbus connection out there. And so we went on the tour and we ate lunch and it was really great. And at the very end of it, I had to stop and use the restroom. And as I'm in the restroom, I notice a sign that was pretty much all of the heads up stuff to internal Facebook staff on where video was going with the new different turnstile ads and Facebook Live and all kinds of different stuff that Facebook was doing on video. So video is very much a focus focus for Facebook. And I think in the next five to 10 years, you're going to see the scales tip heavily towards Facebook. Facebook isn't going anywhere anytime fast. So another thing that's very, very important to producing video content for marketing is really mapping that to different stages in the customer life cycle or what the inbound camp calls the buyer's journey, right? And we as consumers go through three different stages typically, and there's a lot of variations on this with different steps, but at its most simplest form, each consumer goes through three stages, awareness, consideration, and decision. In the awareness stage is typically when we become aware of something and then we're driven online to go find out more information. We may have a curiosity or a pain point or a problem, and we're gonna get on to some type of a search engine, Google, YouTube, uh, probably not Facebook, because Facebook search is a little bit dicey at times. But we're going to get on and we're going to start to seek out information. And the first thing that catches our eye in that 10 seconds that we actually give our attention is where we're going to click. And if that's your video, then you've started that process. So then the question is, what type of content is really good for the awareness stage? So I'll show you an example. window, um, it's a rectangular window that uh, 
has hinges on one side and it swings open using a crank. It's a little bit light the on the audio. The unique feature of a casement window is it's really the most energy efficient operable window that you can purchase for your home. And that's really in regards to the sash and the frame. So the sash, when it closes, it's fully encompassed inside of the frame and the locking mechanisms that lock the window actually fold inside of each other. So that locking device really creates a solid seal around the entire frame and sash of the window. You operate it from one lever, but what happens inside the window is, is the really cool feature because it has multiple points where that one lever connects. When you crank them open, they actually crank open to a full 90 degrees. So you can, um, so you can wipe down the exterior and the interior right from inside your home. The other cool feature is that our screen is actually located on the inside. So there's really no need to ever go outside when you have a casement window to clean it. So here's a quick question for the crowd. By a show of hands, how many people think that that video was targeted towards consumers? Quick show of hands. One, two, few of you. How many people think it was targeted towards businesses? Just one. Both of you are right. That actually was a video that was targeted to both the consumer market. It was hosted on YouTube, uh, and it was also used as sales tools during the sales process for window dealers of Simonton. So that video was shot for Simonton Windows. They're based out of Columbus, recently uh, acquired by Plygem, which is now makes them the largest vinyl window manufacturer on the planet. Uh, Julie Biddle was their marketing manager for the Vista window side. And the idea here is that for awareness, the consumer says, hmm, I have a pain point. I need new windows. But I have no idea what my options are. I don't know anything about windows. I don't know how I should replace windows, what type of windows are available, what's going to fit in my home. And so to produce awareness content, they produce a series of videos that talk about different window styles. How are they made? What's the makeup? Where do they look best? What are the design aesthetics for each one of these window types? That's very, very good information for a consumer who is early on in the process. But not everybody shops for things online. Some people want to pick up the phone and set up a meeting with a local window dealer and have that conversation. I think we had one of the millennials on the panel who was very, you know, I want to have human to human conversation and that's okay. So that awareness type content is also designed for a window dealer, essentially a salesperson who's also the consultant, who is also the installer to sit down and have a resource to share with that client to help educate them as they go through the process. So that's awareness. Help me define what my problem is and understand it. The next phase of the journey is really about consideration. So now we've framed up our problem, we understand what we're trying to do, what we're trying to solve, and what our options are. Now we, better, now we want to understand what the actual need is and more of the how-to type content. Okay, I understand my problem, now how do I solve it? So let's look at an example of a different type of video for that. Hopefully the audio is a little louder. Cleaning the tilt and slide window is really easy. There's just a few things you need to know. First, you will want to unlock the window. Then you need to slide okay. the sash open enough so that it clears the interior of the frame. Then you want to release the brake bars that are hidden inside of the heavy duty tilt latches. You do this by pushing down on the top one and pulling up on the bottom latch. Once the bar is released, you need to push the bar into the frame cavity. This engages the braking system, which keeps the sash locked into place while it's open. Grab the sash and swing Thank it you. out. And we're gonna repeat the same exact thing with the other sash. So first off, selling windows is not the sexiest business in the game. It's a lot of technical information. It's a lot of product information. But what you're seeing here is a how-to video, okay? I'm considering a casement window for my home. Vista knows that one of their core target audience is the woman of the house, typically who is going to be very involved in the purchase decisions and probably involved in selecting the type of product based on her needs. One of her needs, right or wrong, may or may be, I want to understand how to clean these windows. I want to understand how they work. I want to understand how they open. And so you produce a how-to video that demonstrates that process and shows the components of that video. Now here's another tricky thing on the video. Do you notice anything different about this video and the first video that you watched other than the nature of the content? Does anybody notice anything different? She was talking before into the camera, that talking head type shoot. Uh, what's, what's interesting is that the first video that you watched was actually produced in Julie's home. 
So we were inside her house. She has Vista windows in her house, and we were shooting those videos there, set up the full interview studio. Uh, it was a very, very quick production. This particular video, because those windows were not installed in anybody's house, was a studio shoot. This was done at Kreber in Columbus, which is a very large scale studio. What you're looking at is a backdrop that they manufactured, installed the windows in, and all that green stuff you see behind there is actually a poster, right, that sits right behind it. But to the consumer, nobody ever can tell that that is produced in a studio and the first one was act actually produced in the home. So again, you can produce very different types of videos with whatever resources you have available or whatever the situation dictates. It just takes a little bit of planning and we're going to give you some documents that are going to help you with that here in just a moment. So now that we've figured out what the pain point is, what the problem is. We're teaching how-to information on how to solve the problem, a little bit different nature of the content and consideration. Now we're going to move to the decision stage. And this is really where typically the consumer is ready to reach out and start saying, okay, who can help me solve my problem? So awareness is about what, what is my problem? Consideration is about how, how do I solve my problem? Decision is about who, who can help me solve my problem? Right? So let's look at an example of, of decision-based content. And again, uh, when you're watching this video, keep in mind that when a consumer gets to decision phase, what they are looking for is to really establish trust in the person that they're about to spend a lot of money with. Hi, I'm Julie, and I'm really excited to introduce you guys to our window buying guide today. It's a new tool that we've put on our website and just developed it in order to help you through the window buying process. In the window buying guide, you'll find types of windows. You'll also find common definitions that will help you speak the window language. And you can also learn how to check a window's energy efficiency. It can be um, a daunting task and there's lots of confusing things as you research online. And so this piece really walks you through steps and navigates you through um, the things that you should be asking when somebody comes into your home to demo a window and talk to you all about it. And it really um, also informs you on the different types and styles that are available. If you're looking at this video on YouTube, you can simply click this link right here and it'll take you to the website where you can download the guide. So I learned a long time ago never to try to stream live video during a presentation because if you're me, it's not going to work. Uh, if you saw Julie kind of do that little flick up, if that video is on YouTube, right there is where you see the YouTube annotation pop up that is a link that allows you to go to their website. And from the video, you can actually go to a landing page that allows you to download the window buying guide. So Vista Window, Simonton Window are HubSpot users. And you go through to the video, you see the video again on the landing page, you fill out the quick form, and then they have your first name, last name, email address, a persona qualifying question, and you are now in their lead database to nurture. Now, what this window buying guide, just a downloadable PDF is designed to do is to be a workbook. So instead of a sales brochure with here's the pricing, here's all the different options, this is really intended to be a worksheet that the consumer then sits down and works through various different questions, fills them out, and then goes to their window dealer to use that as a conversation starter. And sales increase because the consumer feels much more informed about this incredibly complicated process of buying windows. Understanding the terminology, knowing what the options are, knowing what the process is, what the costs are, that's a lot of information for a purchase that you're likely to do once, maybe twice in your lifetime. Right? So a document like this, using video to drive people to the document as opposed to, as opposed to the sale is really where I think the meat of content marketing comes in in terms of video. Do not try to use video to drive people to the sale. Drive them to the information that allows them to make the buying decision and feel more informed. So number three is always map your content to persona life cycle stages. Number one, that starts with really understanding your audience. How many people in the room for their business have what is called marketing personas or profiles or really just a snapshot of who is your ideal customers? Who are the people you're trying to do business with? If your hand is not up, that is your first challenge. Go back and figure out the two to five different types of ideal customers. And notice that I say ideal customer. This is not just anybody with money who is willing to buy your stuff. This is the right type of customer who's going to have the budget, but then eventually really appreciate what you have to deliver to them and hopefully tell their friends because they're so pleased with what they've purchased from you. 
Okay, that's the ideal customer. So your challenge is, if you don't have those, develop two to three of those, maybe five of those, and start to flesh out who that is. Once you have those, start thinking through what is their journey. So if you have a persona that is window willy, what is window willy going to need to understand during awareness, consideration, and decision to ultimately make a purchase of new windows in his home? Take that product and replace it with the product or service that you sell. If you would like an exercise on how to do this, so my team and I uh, developed an exercise that we call content activation. You can go to that bit.ly forward slash content activation. There's an entire webcast, I believe there's a recorded webinar and some downloads of templates that, that give you a process to facilitate this with your team. So you'll see a bunch of people standing around with a bunch of posters and sticky notes. Those posters actually are persona posters that has all the information for the target audiences. And this is a round robin timed exercise that's a heck of a lot of fun. Uh, and in about 20 to 30 minutes, you and five to six of your coworkers could probably come up with a few hundred different ideas, brainstorming of what type of content, what type of questions can you answer for your, your audience, for your customers. And then you simply map those questions to what stage of the buying journey are they in. So go ahead and scan that code and download that. So number four. Master basic production skills. Remember that I said that the power is not with production companies anymore. We don't need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and years of schooling to be able to produce good video. We need an iPhone or Blab or Facebook Live or a DSLR camera, all of which are very, very affordable and well within your reach in terms of the learning curve to be able to understand how to operate. You get on iMovie. iMovie is a great little editing suite. It's very intuitive. You can go all the way up to Adobe Premiere if you want to get really complicated with it. Um, but pick what's going to work for you. How do you learn how to do this stuff? Well, we also live in the age of online MOOCs or massive online uh, learning centers. And one of them is Builder Digital Arts. There is a complete video production certificate program. Uh, I'm a big believer in a lot of the online learning and certificate program. Online learning is not for everybody. A lot of people really don't resonate well unless they're in a classroom and they have that human to human instruction. But if you have people in your company that adapt to this, by all means, check out the video production certificate program. There is a series of courses and classes that will give you all the skills you need if you have the diligence to work through it in terms of producing your own video. But it doesn't stop there. You can go to video maker training, uh, not a certificate course, but a lot of spot courses in terms of how to complete this one task for video production, how to use Adobe's suite, how to use iMovie. A lot of different resources there as well. Uh, some are free, some are paid. The certificate is actually a paid certificate, but you're talking a few hundred dollars. Uh, Linda video training, there's a lot of free and paid resources there, and Linda is actually massive because Linda does not just specifically educate on video production, they'll educate you on anything that you want. There's all kinds of learning resources. So invest the time and the energy to go in and start to study video production as a business and designate certain roles in your company as somebody or, or hire somebody in who you can specifically train to do this stuff. Because once you build that internal capacity in your organization, that then turns it into a program. It becomes less of a campaign, something with a definite start and stop point, and more of an ongoing program that now you've got this capability internally and you can use it over and over and over again. This is about making an investment that's going to give you returns over the long term. Some of the other ways you can do this is if you simply don't have the time or the wherewithal to get through training and, and learn how to do it for yourselves, you don't necessarily need to use local connections anymore to source video talent, particularly if you're a business that has multiple different locations or serves multiple different markets. It is very, very expensive to hire a local videographer or local producer and send them on the road with equipment for a period of time to go produce that client testimonial in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. I think that's Rhode Island. Um, Rhode Island? Moonsocket, maybe? Yeah, I'm, I failed at geography. I was a marketer. Um, but you can use things like Elance, LinkedIn, Crew Connection, Production Hub, Video Pixie is another one. These are massive online networks where it's a two sided network. Video producers jump on, and you jump on, and you can broker different deals. So, particularly for doing things off in spot markets, these are great resources for you to check into and start to establish your presence uh, as somebody who's, who's going to be doing video over and over and over again. 
Another thing that's going to help you, and I told you we had some, some templates for you as well. When you are, as an internal team, planning out bigger productions, uh, let's say that you want to go and do a customer story and produce a video on that, or if you have uh, different types of shows that you want to produce for maybe episodic content, you're going to need some documentation. So if you go to bit.ly forward slash pre-pro-pack, there are five free production templates. Uh, one is an advanced shot, shot list template. It's going to allow you to think through the shots that you want to get to help you plan how many resources that you have. Any producer, if you hand them a shot list, they'll be able to work with you on that and tell you, you know, that's going to help with estimating budget. Uh, camera angle worksheet, if you want to get real creative, you can start to work with your producer to think through those things. Uh, location scouting form is very, very important. Any producer that you work with, or if you're doing it on your own, make sure that you go and visit your location first. Go at about the time of the day that you think you're going to produce the video to understand what your natural light is doing at that time. Um, you know, that first video, the third video that you saw, we actually shot that in Vista's office, and we had originally planned to do it in front of a scrim, and one of our lights died out. And so we went and found the nearest window and used all natural light and overhead lights to light that video. And it looked just fine. You can see some difference in quality from the other videos, but it's good enough for the internet. It's good enough to get the message out there and effectively communicate what you're trying to do. Uh, and then finally, there is a storyboard template and talent release form. So if you are with clients, it's a little bit different, but if you are shooting general consumers, uh, even if they're in the background, make sure that you get their permission to use their likeness on video. Uh, there are people that get sued all the time because they are, they, they happen uh, to be in a video and they didn't want to be there, and so they find the person that produced the video and they take them to court. So I always recommend using a talent release form. You can download all five of those templates there, uh, and hopefully they'll help you if you're working with an external firm or if you're just working to do it yourself. Using video in your Facebook ads is a great way to keep your audience engaged. To start, just click the arrow in the top right corner and select Create Ads. Select the Video Views objective and select the page you want to advertise for. Just click to upload a new video or select one you've used before from your library. Format requirements for your video are on the right. After your video loads, you can choose a thumbnail. This is the still image that people will see in your ad before it plays. Just click to select one. Next, you can add your message. Or see what your video ad will look like in Newsfeed or on mobile. To finish your ad, just choose the audience you want to reach and set a budget. After a short review period, we'll deliver your ad. And in Ads Manager, you can get details on your ad's performance, so you can see how people are responding to your video ad. For more info, visit facebook.com slash business. So in a former career, I spent about a year working with Bob Evans Restaurants as their digital marketing person over the restaurant side of the business. We worked with a very, very large agency out of Pittsburgh, PA, uh, to do all of our media buying, video production, and everything else. And I got to basically be in and manage those meetings with that agency. And I can tell you that we would have meetings to determine what are the spot buys? What networks are we going to be on? When are we going to run these? How much of a run can we afford? How do we allocate this budget of a couple million dollars per year to be spread across various different media properties, networks, channels, programming, so on and so forth? And the agency would go back and they would come back to us, you know, in a couple weeks with here's the plan and then we'd argue about it and we'd try to trim down the budget. And at the end of the day, three months later, we're now producing some videos. They're starting to run on network television and Bob Evans is a couple, well, tens of thousands per spot and maybe a couple million dollars committed to a video budget. Today, all of you, this afternoon, if you would like, could get on Facebook and you could place a media buy. You could use Facebook videos as tool and you could place a media buy to get your video to hundreds, if not thousands, if not tens of thousands or millions of people using Facebook's targeting. Now, I won't go into a lot of the details because we have an entire session on Facebook advertising coming up, which I think is going to be really great. But know this, there has never been a video network on the face of the planet where you can purchase a video view for an average of two to three cents per view. Two to three cents per human view on Facebook. There is no reason for any business of any size 
not to be taking advantage of this technology. And I do agree with Mike too. We've experimented this as, with this as well. Do not put your videos on YouTube and drop a link onto Facebook. You will not get the same effect. Facebook is going to favor video that you upload to that network and use their advertising tools. Why? Because Facebook doesn't exist for puppy dogs, kittens, and to connect the world. Facebook is an ad-supported network. Okay, while Zuckerberg may want to save the planet and do all this kumbaya stuff, Sheryl Sandberg's about making money. And that's where the advertising model comes in. So invest in Facebook advertising. I promise you it will help you raise awareness and you will get good at it very quickly because these tools are very, very simple to use. And it's a lot of fun too. Talked over that slide. So number five, extend your content reach. Social networks in particular are mostly all ad supported networks, okay? Uh, some are more expensive than others. I'm not sure what the geo filter on Snapchat cost for this conference. I know that Jay Barris spent about 550 doing one at Oracle Marketing Cloud uh, for a geo filter on Snapchat. Most of the brands on Snapchat today that are advertising, uh, like X Games, uh, are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for those advertisements. So it's very early on in terms of Snapchat's ad products and for right now, my opinion is they are very far out of reach for small businesses. Probably not forever. Facebook advertising in the early days was very much out of reach for small businesses. It was only really what big brands could afford. Now there's an entire self-service platform that for $25, $50, $100, you can advertise on video. And you can do that right from your office. Uh, whatever the platform is, make sure that you have a budget to advertise your videos. Jay Bear has a saying in his book, Utility, another great book. Uh, one of the tenants is market your marketing, right? So a lot of times we as marketers think, oh, we've just produced this great video. Oh, we're done. No, that's absolutely when the work starts. You've produced the content. Now you have to put dollars and energy and time behind it to get it out to as wide of an audience as you possibly can. And Facebook advertising in particular is a very effective way to do that. So again, we'll reiterate with Bill, the long-term winners are those who use the medium to deliver information and entertainment. And the way that you do that is through five simple steps. Number one, build a permanent office studio. You're gonna increase your frequency, you're gonna increase your spontaneity, and always, always, always capture the content. Even if you have an inkling that there might be a story or some interesting tidbit there, capture it. Because if you don't capture it, you don't have it and there's nothing you can do with it later. Establish your video channel, pick one. Pick one place and get really, really good at that and then diversify. And the way that you get really good and build an audience is through consistency and frequency and quality as well. Three, map content to persona lifecycle stages. First, start by understanding who are your ideal clients. Who are the three to five people that we want to target as our ideal clients and then understand what their educational and informational needs are through those three stages, awareness, consideration, and decision. Number four, master basic, basic production skills. There's all kinds of resources out there where you can go and learn it on your own, hire somebody in, but build this as an internal capacity to your business because now you're going to be set up for a long-term ongoing program. And finally, make sure that you extend your, the reach of your content. Go out and, and determine what is our advertising budget. You don't need a lot. $100 a month on something like Facebook can get you a long way. Even Instagram, it can get you a long way. So figure out what your budget is and be willing to pay to play. With that, I'm Nate Riggs, and I really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you.